very good afternoon to all. And I thank this uh, high performance computing workshop organized by IT Madras uh, Materials and Mechanics for this invitation so that we can uh, share our research to a broader community. Uh, am I audible properly? Uh, yes, you are, but I think you have to uh, make your screen full. Okay, uh, just one minute. Yeah. Okay, so uh, is it visible? Yeah. Okay. Uh, it is. So, yeah. Yes. yeah, okay. Uh, so today we are going to talk about uh, some of the recent advances uh, we actually made um, in our group prior to joining IAC and also the ongoing work, which is going on here uh, towards fast and accurate access scale quantum mechanical calculations using finite element discretization and mixed precision arithmetic. So to give you a motivation of this particular work, uh, so if you look at quantum mechanical calculations, they have been quite successful in, in predicting a wide of material properties, with mechanical properties of materials, space stability materials, thermal properties, electronic properties, magnetic and optical properties, and so on. It is very surprising to see or note that the quantum material modeling involving DFT and post-DFT calculations occupy 30% of world's computational resources today. In fact, publications per year on these calculations, which is basically using quantum mechanics to model materials, grow from mere 77 in the year 1985 to around 18,000 in 2013. And now, seven years after that, it would be more than 50,000, I guess. Workhorse for most of these calculations is quantum mechanical theories, mainly density functional theory and post density functional theories. And if you look at the impact of these quantum material modeling on science, the citations of this seminal work by Walter Cohn, for which he has received the Nobel Prize for his density functional theory in the year 1964-1965 was when he proposed, but he got his Nobel Prize in the year 1998. It has immense impact in a variety of areas, be it applied physics, organic chemistry, nanotechnology, condensed matter areas, and then optical properties, energy fluids, electrochemistry, name an area, it has an impact in that area. And it is very interesting to see that 12 of the 100 most cited papers today in scientific literature pertain to density functional theory calculations or calculations which are based on that. You can imagine what an impact it has created uh, from the time this water course has proposed his theory. But if you look at the state of the art in density functional theory calculations and also co uh, calculations which are based on density functional theory, there have been 100 available quantum material modeling cores which have been developed since 1980. You can see here from 1995 to the year 2015 and beyond, you can see an exponential growth in the citations of these uh, uh, softwares. So the majority of the people actually rely on BLAS, the quantum expresso, to do their density function theory calculations. Most of the physicists do, and many of the computational chemists actually rely on GAN yes. or NWPM or Gaussian kind of softwares. But if you look at the relationship to HPC, uh, if you look at relationship to HPC for the in the context of this quantum mechanical modeling. This can be summarized in this cartoon here. If you look at areas like continuum areas like modeling, climate change, or geophysics modeling, in fact, they have been mature enough to take advantage of the parallel computing architectures today and then do extreme scale based and solve, understand realistic uh, and actually simulate realistic phenomena. But if you look at the quantum mechanical modeling of materials, most of the calculations have been restricted in this high throughput regime, where you actually have small, small calculations, and then you try to fill up the parallel supercomputer using this high throughput, uh, using these kind of small, small calculations. The reason why are we interested in actually uh, making our codes more mature, like the areas of conversion and climate simulation, even in the regime of quantum mechanical length scale, is because if you look at the processing power, increase in the processing power over the years, if you look at this, uh, in the past few decades, you can see that the number of transistors uh, on these ICs approximately doubled every two years, which means the computing power has been growing phenomenally. But, uh, and then, if you look at the kind of evolution of supercomputers from the petascale to exascale today, if you look at in India itself, we have these uh, petascale supercomputers, which is uh, Paramsirti, which is India's fastest supercomputer today, which is 5.3 petaflops at CDAC Kone, which was unveiled last year, November. 
And if you look at uh, the machine at IIC, which is being upgraded and which is going to be up and running in a couple of months, is 3.3 petaflops. So we have already machines which are crossing one petaflops in India. And if you look at the world's fastest supercomputers, one example is Summit in the US, it actually is 200 petaflops, which is ranked two in the world. And in this year, 2021, they're going to get this Aurora, which is the world's first exascale computer, 1,000 petaflops. So as we can see how the computing power is dramatically changing in the last five years or last 10 years to today. But are the algorithms keeping up pace with these disruptive advancements which are happening in parallel computing and computing architectures is a question we have to ask specifically in the context of quantum mechanical modeling materials. It is not keeping up pace with the evolution of these architectures. The reason is the key issues which actually are in this is lack of scalable computational methods which can actually take advantage of this increase in processing power and also lack of versatile computational methods which can handle complexities in material modeling specifically at the quantum landscape and the, another important challenge is here these methods actually either square cubically or quantically depending upon the theory you're using at the quantum mechanical end scale with the number of atoms which means quickly quick, very quickly the computational cost very close goes very fast as you keep increasing the number of atoms and these are really the challenges which has to be addressed and the kind of uh, work which we have done in the last few years, in fact, tries to address some of these limitations which I'm going to describe. But why are these large scale quantum mechanical computations important? That's a question which we have to ask. There are many areas, for example, understanding these chemical properties of nanoparticles in the sense how different they are from the bulk counterparts, let's say in accelerating some of the reactions in the design of the catalyst. Or for example, if you're looking at current voltage characteristics in the context of biological systems, like the presence of a DNA in the presence of an electrode, how does current voltage characteristics actually behave in the context of design of nanoscale devices? Again, we require large scale quantum mechanical calculations. And let's see if you want to understand the um, if you want to understand defects in materials, even though defects are present in very small concentrations, they have a significant influence in the macroscopic properties of materials. And again, to actually simulate these defects in materials at the quantum mechanical end scale, you will really require thousands of ten, ten thousands to tens of thousands of atoms. In fact, so there are this is just a few examples, and there are many other examples where really large scale quantum mechanical modeling calculations are required. So now let's get into some of the methodological advances we have made in the past few years in the context of accelerating these density functional theory calculations and then I'll talk about some of the future works which are currently working on as well. So in density functional theory, we are interested in solving a nonlinear eigenvalue problem. We're interested in solving a nonlinear eigenvalue problem where let's say this is a nonlinear eigenvalue problem and we are actually interested in solving not just one or two or three, we're interested in solving n smallest eigenfunctions and eigenvalues where n is dependent on the number of electrons in the system. As your number of atoms in the system grows, number of electrons grow, and then you have to solve as many as number of electrons in the system are there, that many eigenvalues and eigenvectors, the smallest eigenvalues. And to add to the complexity, this is not just a linear eigenvalue problem, this is a non-linear eigenvalue problem, because the eigenfunctions, if you look at this partial differential equations, the eigenfunctions are themselves actually are used to compute something called electron density, which is a probability density of finding an electron. And again, the operator here, which you see here, is a function of these particular electron density. So which means you solve for, you guess the initial electron density rho, compute the eigenvalues and eigenvectors, and again, recompute electron density, and then you actually compute this potential again, solve for eigenfunctions, and then you solve this particular nonlinear eigenvalue problem still consistently till your electron density converges into successive iterations. So this is a very important ingredient of any density functional theory calculation where we have to solve a nonlinear eigenvalue problems and the number of eigenvalues and eigenvectors we are interested in the smallest eigenvalues and eigenvectors uh, and the number of eigenvectors we are interested in depends on the number of electrons in the system. Now, in conventional, uh, so uh, departing from the conventional state of the art methodologies, which actually use plane waves, the science and cosines to solve this uh, density functional theory calculations, as I show here. So people conventionally use uh, subplane wave bases, which are nothing but sines and cosines, because they are the eigenfunctions of the Laplace operator. And if you're interested in bulk properties of materials, the periodic properties of materials, they are a natural choice of basis functions to solve. 
And they're also very efficient in the sense because they actually have spectral convergence to have a systematic convergence as well as these basis functions to solve these particular partial differential equations, which involves solving a nonlinear eigenvalue problem. On the top of it, there are certain convolution integrals in evaluation of electrostatics in this particular uh, density functional theory problem. And these plane waves, in fact, which is nothing but the Fourier space calculations, are very efficient in converting these convolution integrals. And hence, many of the quantities that convert are actually computed very efficiently. So many of the solid state physicists actually who are interested in bulk properties of materials uh, significantly rely on this plane wave basis codes to actually do these calculations. But because we are interested in large scale calculations, where plane waves actually cannot uh, are not scalable to very large scale calculations because these wave, these plane waves are actually extended in real space, and because of that, they have a lot of communication across different processes. So, and our objective is actually to develop methods which can actually scale to large scale quantum mechanical calculations, and also we are interested in solving problems which can accommodate arbitrary boundary conditions. We want to solve, let's say. Uh, periodic, non-periodic, and so on, and hence, which is again not suited for plane waves because plane waves are periodic calculations. Plane wave basis sets actually can simulate periodic calculations more efficiently. So, so in uh, so we, we actually we depart with the we depart from the conventional state of the art calculations and we resort to finite element discretization to actually solve these DFT equations. And those finite elements is nothing new in the context of the mechanics community because people have been routinely using these calculations from 1950s to solve structural mechanics and to some extent now fluid mechanics problems as well. But what are the advantages of these finite element bases in the context of quantum mechanical equations, solving quantum mechanical equations is that the adaptive spatial resolution you finite elements can actually provide is very beneficial in density functional theory calculations because of the because we are interested in some features which we uh, we want to interest we are interested in actually refining the regions where we are interested and course in the regions which we are not interested at the same time these basis functions are polynomials and hence complex geometries can be represented and arbitrary boundary conditions can be imposed which is very important in the context of quantum mechanical calculations and and like sines and cosines, the plane wave basis, we also have systematic convergence in these basis sets because they're polynomial basis. And we can actually solve both all electron system and superpotential DFT calculations because we have uh, finite elements can actually accommodate unstructured core screening so that we can resolve the oscillations in the solutions of these quantum mechanical equations which are present in all electron calculations. And the most important of all these basis functions are compact and hence on parallel computing architectures, they are they scale very well. So now if you look at, uh, even though these, these advantages exist for finite element basis for density functional theory calculations, but there are some major challenges for DFT in the context of major challenges for the use of finite elements in the context of density functional theory calculations. The first is, unlike the areas of mechanics and solid mechanics and fluid mechanics, where we are just interested in the convergence of displacement fields, we are interested in maybe computing stresses and strains using these finite elements, in density functional theory, in quantum mechanical modeling of materials, we are interested in computing specific properties of materials. We are interested in computing something called ground state energy of the system by solving these eigenvalues and eigenvectors of the nonlinear eigenvalue problem, which I specified before, which means we need to have precisely accurate calculation. We need to have very accurate calculations because when you're computing properties, like let's say vacancy formation energy, or effect formation energy, so we're computing adsorption energies or any other properties for that matter, which involves the very accurate uh, comparisons with experiments, you need to have very accurate calculations. So because of which, Finite elements, even though they have been explored in density function theory calculations a decade or a dec more than a decade back, but they have not been popular in the context of quantum mechanical calculations because they have a huge degree of freedom disadvantage because of the stringent accuracy requirements you have. And finite element bases are non orthogonal, as you're all aware, and it results in a generalized eigenvalue problem, which is more challenging to solve than a conventionally uh, solving a standard eigenvalue problem. So, because of these restrictions, even though people have exploited or explored this proof of concept ideas using finite elements for solving these DFT equations, they have not become very popular. But we try to address these limitations and try to significantly advance these calculations using finite elements as I'm going to show here. 
So uh, now if you take this nonlinear eigenvalue problem, which I mentioned here, the partial differential equations, which I just posed before. Now, if you discretize using finite element basis, it results in a generalized eigenvalue problem. And this generalized eigenvalue problem comprises of this H, which is a discretized Hamiltonian matrix, or in other words, in the mechanics language, you can call it the stiffness matrix. And this M is the mass matrix in mechanics language, but it's nothing but the overlap matrix, which is arising because of the overlap of the Lagrange basis functions used in the finite element discretization. Now, this is a generalized eigenvalue problem, but you can actually convert into a standard eigenvalue problem by doing this Cholesky decomposition of M, and then we can finding the positive inverse square root of m, which is basically m power half into m power half. And then you can transform this standard eigenvalue problem into a uh, generalized eigenvalue problem into a standard eigenvalue problem by computing this inverse square root of the mass matrix. And as you can see, now we have a modified transformed standard eigenvalue problem, but this will involve computation of m power minus half. And you know that in finite elements, one can, you might require to use millions of degrees of freedom in computation of m power minus half may not be trivial because it no longer is sparse matrix unlike the original mass matrix and the stick mass matrix right so this computation of m per minus half may not be so trivial so we need efficient methods to actually evaluate m per minus half which we're going to discuss now so the first thing uh, which actually addressed basically the high degree of freedom disadvantage which I was talking about in using finite elements in the context of giving you stringent accuracy which you require for material properties prediction we can actually see that we did a we did actually uh, try to solve this TFT problem from linear finite elements which is popularly used in the mechanics community to a finite element or uh, interpolating polynomial order of order six basically so we used all the way from one to four and six and we actually actually took this uh, two benchmark problems, which is copper nanoparticle comprising of 55 and the small BCC super cell, which comprises of 53 atoms with a vacancy. So now if you look at this uh, degree of freedom uh, advantage, which you have in the context of uh, higher order finite elements, the same accuracy can be, and we solve this problem to the same accuracy. And as you can see, the linear finite elements compares, comparing that with the sixth order finite elements, the fourth order finite elements, you can see that there is a tremendous drop in the reduction of degrees of freedom, which is required to solve the problem. And does this translate into improved computational efficiency? In fact, if we observe that it is because as you keep increasing the finite element interpolating polynomial, obviously you know, the bandwidth of the matrices increase and you would require uh, expensive matrix matrix multiplications and probably you might also affect the convergence of the iterative schemes which you employ. But we actually find that we actually get a significant advantage in using this fourth order or sixth order finite elements in comparison to this linear or quadratic finite elements to the accuracies we are interested in the DFT problem. So this is something which is a uh, departure from the conventional wisdom where you just use linear and quadratic in mechanics community. So in fact, we saw that we get thousand X advantage by using higher order finite element basis in the context of uh, SD functional theory calculations. And we also resort to something called spectral finite elements, which are basically uh, different from the conventional Lagrange polynomial finite elements, which are actually constructed over equispace nodes, which we usually do. And in the context of spectral finite elements, we still use Lagrange basis functions, but they're constructed over special set of points, which are called gauss lobato legendary points. And these gauss lobato legendary points are nothing but the roots of the derivatives of the legendary polynomials. So now the nodal locations in your finite element actually are lying at those special set of points, which are the gauss lobato legendary points. But why are these important for us? Because if you look at the overlap matrix which you have, in the context of this finite element discretization of nonlinear eigenvalue problem, which is this mass matrix. Now, if you actually use a quadrature rules, which is uh, coincident with the nodal points, now if you use these gauss lobato legendary points itself as quadrature rules, which are coincident with the nodal points, then you can immediately see that this particular mass matrix or overlap matrix becomes diagonal. Now, the moment it becomes diagonal, it is so trivial to evaluate this inverse positive square root of the mass matrix because we just uh, find the square root of the diagonal entry, so you can just invert it. So this is an important this is an important thing because we can now work with the standard eigenvalue problem, which we actually discussed in the previous slide, without having to solve a generalized eigenvalue problem. Now, 
having actually reduced the star furniture, having actually reduced a generalized eigenvalue problem into a standard eigenvalue problem by using spectral finite elements and higher order spectral finite elements, we actually have to solve an eigenvalue problem as a set. Now we actually resort to a Schrodinger filtered subspace iteration procedure. Uh, the reason is because we do not want to actually solve using expensive eigen solvers like Kylo subspace methods, which only have uh, one vector as a starting vector, and you kind of uh, keep computing the Kylo subspace, and these methods become very very expensive. But in the context of uh, subspace iteration procedures, these are extension of power iterations to a bunch of vectors where you actually uh, in the usual subspace iteration procedure, in fact, uh, the convergence of these methods actually rely or depend upon how well your eigenvalues are magnified. That's why they are not very popular in solving eigenvalue problems. But if you combine these particular subspace iteration or simultaneous iteration approaches, which is conventionally used in numerical linear algebra or taught in numerical linear algebra literature, you can actually magnify this particular spectrum of interest by using Chebyshev polynomials. Why? Because these Chebyshev polynomials grow very far to the left of minus one in comparison to the growth between minus one and one. And now in DFT problem, we are interested in this wanted spectrum that is the lowest end of the spectrum. And we map this wanted spectrum to the left of minus one, where your Chebyshev polynomials grow very far to the left of minus one. And the unwanted spectrum will be between minus one and one. Because, as I said, the subspace iteration procedure depends upon the convergence of the method, depends upon how well the eigenvalues are well separated. And because you're magnifying the region of interest using the Schrodinger polynomials, you, in fact, uh, get a very enhanced convergence of the eigenspectrum, which is of interest, by damping out the unwanted spectrum. So this is basically the Chebyshev filtered subspace iteration, and we found that this method was substantially faster than the conventional eigen solvers based on Kylo subspace or Lanczos iteration, and like for example Lanczos iteration methods. And in fact, we found that it was actually almost a hundred to two hundred times faster by using the Chebyshev filtered subspace iteration methods in in comparison to just solving a standard eigenvalue problem or a generalized eigenvalue problem using these color of space methods. So now putting all these pieces together, we basically start with an initial guess for electron density. And now you compute this elementals, uh, you compute this discretized stiffness matrix. And then you now, you compute a Chebyshev filter space, that is you construct recursively the Chebyshev polynomial expansion. And then you start with, you start hitting the starting space of vectors, which you started with this Chebyshev polynomial. And then you compute a filter subspace of vectors, but you note that in any subspace iteration procedure, these vectors approach the largest eigenvectors. So you need to orthonormalize them to actually peel off the components of one vector on other vectors so that you converge to the eigenspace of interest and you orthonormalize the Shibisha filtered basis. And then you do a really rich projection, which means you compute a smaller Hamiltonian or a smaller matrix by projecting this bigger matrix into the Shibisha filtered space. And then you diagonalize that particular smaller matrix and then you do a subspace rotation, which is mapping back these filtered vectors into using this eigenspace of the smaller Hamiltonian, which gives you an approximate eigenvectors of the original matrix. And the eigenvalues of this smaller matrix actually would be uh, would be the approximations to the eigenvalues of the original matrix. And then using this eigenvectors and eigenvalues, now we compute electron density of interest, which is which is by squaring these wave functions, and then you repeat this procedure self consistently, which will give you convergence. So, using this particular procedure, we're now we actually, this is a new approach using parent element basis, and hence we need to compare the accuracies we get um, uh, using our methodology in comparison to what accuracies we are getting with already existing state of the art plane wave codes out there. And for that, we actually did benchmark studies on periodic supercells, taking this magnesium to cross to cross to supercells with the vacant increasing all the way from 310 electrons to 2,500 electrons and similarly molybdenum BCC supercells from all the way from 210 electrons to 2,000 electrons. And similarly, we have non-periodic isolated systems where we actually to go from 3,000 electrons to 6,000 electrons. And in all these particular systems, we observed that we get very close match for energies and forces when, when you compare our density functional theory based calculations using finite elements and the quantum expresso based calculations, which uses the state of the art plane wave basis codes out there. So we get accuracies in energy, which is matching up to four to five decimal places, depending upon the grid uh, we choose in our basis.
Now, this is fine. So how, so far we have a methodology and we have complete accuracies. Now, the most important thing is how do you implement on heterogeneous architectures today? Because we really have to take advantage of the evolving heterogeneous architectures today to make sure that you get good parallel scalability and you have minimal data access cost and you have operations which are more automatically intense. So now the, if you look at the key fundamental kernel in the Shibisha filtering, which involves the recursive construction of a Shibisha polynomial of a matrix H, will involve this matrix times the matrix multiplication, where this H is a sparse matrix, which is obtained you by a finite element discretization, and your X is a dense matrix, which comprises of all the wave functions you're interested in. If you're interested in 10,000 wave functions, this X would be 10,000 columns. And the number of columns of this matrix would be the number of grid points in your domain, obviously, right? So this is the most key fundamental kernel in, in, to basically evaluate if you accelerate this, all your calculations will be very fast. Now, if you look at this particular um, operation, we don't build the sparse matrix in our approach. Without building the sparse matrix, we work at the finite element cell level. The reason we do that is because a sparse matrix sparse matrices, sparse matrix based approaches have been shown to have a lot of data access cost and also a lot of bookkeeping because of the way of you store the sparse matrix. And in parallel computing architectures, they also involve more communication as well. So instead of doing a, by computing the global sparse matrix, cell level where we actually evaluate the finite element cell stiffness matrix or the cell Hamiltonian matrix or discretized Hamiltonian matrix. Then we extract the finite element level vectors which we are interested in. In fact, this is a big vector which we actually are multiplying here, which comprises of all the degrees of freedom and for each degree of freedom, the number of vectors. Now, since this would be memory hungry to store all the vectors in one go, while we're doing their operations, we actually choose a block size PF and extract the data from this big matrix. And then we extract the cell level data for every cell using extraction or extraction kernels, which we actually wrote on GPUs and as well as CPUs as well. And then we actually do these five Finite element level cell matrix matrix multiplication. As we know, the finite element level cell matrices are dense matrices. The dense, small dense matrix matrix multiplication can be massively parallelized in a given processor because they need not talk to any other cell. One cell has its own cell level matrix matrix multiplication, which is independent of what is happening at the other cell level. So you just compute the cell level matrix matrix multiplications, which is uh, which is between a discretized cell Hamilton matrix and this extracted cell level vector from the global vector. And then you compute these output vectors, which are the output matrix matrix products actually. Okay. Now, once you finished computation of the cell level output vectors matrix product, now you have to assemble it back because you need to add the contributions of the shared grid points, the shared finite element nodes, which are shared across different finite element cells. And hence you assemble it and form the global vector. And this assembly is not an all to all communication across processors, and it is only a communication with the neighboring nodes, which you are sharing the neighboring cells, which you are sharing. And if your cell is on a different processor, you only have to talk to processors, which this particular given grid point is shared with, right? And since this is basically not a very, uh, uh, this is not a communication, which involves all to all communication. In fact, we allow for using this communication in mixed precision, in a single precision, basically, we do this matrix matrix products in all double precision, but we just allow for communication to happen across processors uh, by using mixed single precision operation communications, basically. So that allows data movement cost and hence communication cost further reduces approach. So now if you look at the performance of this implementation, we have implemented this on CPUs and we have implemented on GPUs. We can see that this core fundamental kernel, which is Shibisha filtering, which involves recursive uh, matrix matrix multiplications as many multiplications as you have in the Shibisha polynomial degree, which you use, you in fact have this as a most key intensive operation. Now, if you look at the performance of this particular kernel on both CPUs and GPUs, we actually see that our GPU implementation is almost 20.4x faster than a CPU implementation. This is just a comparison on uh, two nodes, basically, two summit nodes at Oak Ridge National Lab, and each node basically has 42 MPA tasks, and each node has six uh, GPUs. And when we actually run this particular implementation on two nodes, we see that we get a 20x speed up in terms of computational cost. So this clearly shows uh, the key fundamental kernel, which is involved in matrix matrix multiplication, has a lot of arithmetic intensity, and the way we formulate it is basically is exploiting this uh, 
uh, arithmetic intensity and thereby we get significant speed ups on GPUs. Now we have the next step is orthogonalization. The orthogonalization step is important because in a subspace iteration procedures, as I said, all the filter vectors, we actually approach the largest eigenvector, but we try to actually orthogonalize these vectors by using a Cholesky Gramsci net based orthogonalization so as to make the space well conditioned. Now this Cholesky factorization involves computation of an overlap matrix, which is of this form. This is like a transpose A kind of matrix and Cholesky factorization is just LL transpose. And then you can actually construct the orthonormal basis by multiplying this filtered basis vectors with this Cholesky factor, which is obtained in this particular step. And this is an order of MN square operation where M is a number of grid points and N is a number of wave functions you have. So this, this may not be a dominant cost for smaller systems, but as the number of atoms in the system increases, this can become significantly dominant cost. And in order to optimize this particular step, we employ mixed precision computations because as we know, we are interested in computing the eigenspace of uh, a given Hamiltonian or a given statistical stiffness matrix, but this Hamiltonian keeps changing every iteration because it is a nonlinear eigenvalue problem. But as we know that as the iterations progresses, we eventually converge the eigenspace, which means these Chebyshev filtered vectors will approximate the eigenvectors of the original Hamiltonian to a greater accuracy. And which means this overlap matrix becomes diagonal because orthonormal vectors, these become orthonormal vectors because the eigenvectors of a symmetric matrix. And I forgot to mention that Hamiltonian matrix or stiffness matrix, which we actually get out of discretization is actually a symmetric matrix. And because of that symmetry, as the iterations progress, your eigenvectors become orthogonal. And the fact that it becomes orthogonal means your overlap matrix is identity. And because it is identity, we can exploit the fact that the diagonal elements are actually dominant than off diagonal elements. And hence we can compute the diagonal elements using double precision and the off diagonal elements are computed using single precision. And we can also exploit this kind of uh, advantage in constructing this orthonormal basis as well by computing the psi f times LD inverse transpose and double precision and the off diagonal part again in single precision. So this will uh, definitely allow us to have reduced compute cost and also reduced data access cost because we actually have to do an MPA or reduce in order to compute this overlap matrix after computing this psi of transpose psi of in a given processor and such computations happen on every processor and or every GPU here, uh, if it is a GPU based implementation and you actually do an MPA or reduce to compute the actual S matrix. So we exploit in addition to this mixed precision approaches we also exploit asynchronous compute and data movement as well because of the huge memory requirement of this overlap matrix or s matrix which is uh, n cross n where n is a number of eigenvectors we're computing this can be very big so we actually compute this particular S matrix in a blockwise approach. And this blockwise approach allows us to actually overlap computes on one block with communication happening for the other block. In this way, we can actually reduce further the data access cost and overlap some of the activities which can be done in parallel. And if you look at the sustained performance of these particular operations, specifically on uh, GPUs, so if you just do with a double precision, you see that we have 30.9 percentage of the P64 peak. But if you, as soon as you put in the mixed precision approach which I discussed, we go and improve the sustained performance by 31 to 52.8 percent of the FP64 peak. And now when we overlap the compute and communication using those asynchronous GPU programming paradigms, we actually improve the sustained performance to 77.6%. This is for the overlap matrix computation, and this is for the orthonormal basis construction. So this way, we can actually optimize our implementation, which is geared for the particular architecture. And similar optimizations have been done in computing the projected Hamiltonian, because that's the next step where you compute a big Hamiltonian and projecting into the subspace by forming a smaller Hamiltonian. And and this will again involve operations of the form psi transpose H psi. And again, we can exploit the fact that this eigen, this particular Sibisha filtered space approaches the eigenspace as the iterations progress. And hence, this particular matrix becomes diagonal in the eigenbasis. And hence, we can actually again exploit uh, mixed precision approaches in computing this projected Hamiltonian and thereby increase the sustained performance cost in our operations. Now, we have employed these approximations of mixed precisions, uh, which means do advanced ex do uh, in places where single precision is important and do uh, calculations using double precision where you know that the calculations are really important. 
So in this kind of mixed precision approaches, we need to be careful about how the accuracy is retained in the context of computing the properties of interest like ground state energy and the forces, which are the major quantities which are computing in this density functional theory calculations. So here we actually take three benchmark examples and we found that we find that the number of iterations, both single double precision and mixed precision takes is identical. And the error we are computing here is with respect to a double precision calculation. And we see the single precision calculation does not incur much error because these approximations are really valid approximations because we're computing quantities which are anyway decaying to zero. And the same kind of um, good behavior is also seen when you're computing the force error as well on atoms. Now, having put the, all these things together, now we will uh, can compare how do we actually do in terms of computation efficiency or in our DFTFE code, which is the finite element based DFT versus how do we do in the state of the art course like quantum espresso. And for that, we take two benchmark systems. One is a periodic benchmark system and there's a non periodic benchmark system. And in a periodic benchmark system, we go all the way from 2000 electrons to 40,000 electrons. And we see that for smaller systems, we are slower. But as we keep growing from 8,000 electrons onwards, we actually start behaving uh, in terms of we, we actually are superior in terms of computation efficiency this is in terms of the compute computation efficiencies like you run the code on this many processors you compute the wall time and wall time into number of processors is your cprs and node hours based on what metric you use and we find that we are really computation efficient when we once we cross it 6,000 electrons or so from 8,000 electrons onwards, we are actually being faster. So this is beating your plane wave basis code in its own turf because plane wave basis codes like quantum espresso is basically designed for it to be computation efficient for periodic calculations. In fact, now if you go for a non-periodic calculations, which is like uh, the advantage for finite element basis, because you can actually coarsen away from the region of interest, because as you go far and far away, you are anyway having a vacuum and this is an isolated system which are simulating. So we can, uh, we can actually resort to uh, the adaptive uh, coarse graining, which can be afforded by finite elements in the context of non periodic calculations, unlike in plane wave basis where the resolution has to be same everywhere and the entire vacuum has to be resolved. And now here we take the example of a copper nanoparticles, which is a non periodic calculation. And then we see that even at 2000 or 3000 electrons itself, we are almost competing with the state of the art code quantum espresso in terms of solving this problem for the same level of accuracy. And then as we keep going farther and farther down, we actually see significant advantage. And if you look at 10,000 electrons, we are almost like 16 times faster than a quantum espresso code. So we also, we also observed a strong scaling on um, all the way from 2000 MPA tasks to 65,000 MPA tasks, where we almost are at 60, 70% efficiency here, where we actually are just at 10, uh, just at uh, 3000 degrees of freedom per processor, in fact. So even in that region, we actually, we can actually, it scales reasonably well to that particular uh, number of processors. And the wall time dramatically reduces for the same problem, which is at 1511 seconds and 2000 tasks to almost 104 seconds, which is on 65,000 tasks. which actually was able to cut down to 14 seconds on 6,720 GPUs. Now, if you look at the big scaling of our implementation, uh, there are three important components of our Shibisha filtering approach. One is an order M in cost, which is basically- Professor Pani, you're almost out of yes. time, so please yeah. wrap it up in two minutes. Sure, 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 yeah, sure. So we have actually, we observe a good big scaling, but we see that because the dominant cost after certain 20,000 electrons is basically uh, dominated here. And we see the efficiency drops in particles because of the nature of the algorithm. But the most important point here is the onset of cubic scaling is significantly delayed, unlike in other codes where you start seeing significantly the cubic scaling kicking in right at 5,000 to 10,000 electrons, 1,000, 10,000 electrons itself. But here we actually extend that particular significantly to almost 20 to 25,000 electrons, where which will allow you to do many more larger systems. 
So this is just a minimum wall time comparison where we can see that we are significantly faster at 20,000 electrons, 8,000 electrons, even at 2,000 electrons from a quantum expresso based code by actually keeping on increasing the processors. And then you see where do you actually reach the minimum wall time? And we see that we are actually faster uh, right at 2,000 electrons itself by a factor of five. And this factor actually keeps on increasing as we just go uh, with bigger and bigger system sizes. And this is one of the highlight of our calculations where we did an 100,000 electron system. And we see that every iteration we could do in just two minutes on a summit, which is uh, using having 3,800 summit nodes. And we actually got 52.6 petaflops for which uh, this particular methodologies were selected as one of the two finalists, Golden Bell finalists in Supercomputing Conference 19, where we almost reached 31.7 percentage of FP64 peak, which is not uh, reached by any other DFT course out there. Yeah, this is basically some of the methodologies which you have developed, and we also kind of uh, applied these to understand electron transport in DNA molecule, where we actually try to do some uh, density of states and localization lens calculations and try to provide some qualitative insights to experimentalists who are trying to develop these experiments uh, to, want to measure this voltage current characteristics in a DNA molecule, which got published recently in Nature Nanotechnology. And we also have applications of these methodologies to compute spin Hamiltonian parameters, which are actually nuclear spin and spin spin and electron spin interactions, which are important for measuring the coherence times in qubits in quantum computing and these all electron DFTP calculations have been used to actually uh, compute these parameters which was not possible before with an accurate calculation and finally giving back to the community we actually have all these methodologies implemented and an open source code has been developed which have been released in 2019 which is the cpu code and the cpu gpu code was released uh, will be released in september 2021 with all these methodologies in there so we have started a new group at IIC, Matrix Lab, after I joined IIC one and a half year back, and there are two teams where we design algorithms for which we are developing and IIC are trying to develop this matrix free approaches for doing this matrix vector multiplications without constructing explicitly the matrix, but trying to work at uh, directly at the cell level without storing any matrix and doing matrix vector multiplications. And we're also working on implementing these PAW pseudopotentials, which gives you generalized eigenvalue problems in DFT itself because of the physics. And we're trying to develop some methodologies for that and also implementing some ex semi local exchange correlations, which are useful to understand solid state battery materials in the context of understanding electrode electrolyte interactions. This is an ongoing work with my PhD students. And these are other uh, problems which are looking at in our group. And finally, I want to acknowledge my current collaborators uh, and most of the work which I, I have presented here um, actually was done at Michigan uh, with my PhD advisor, Professor Vikram Gavini, and Sambit Das, who's a postdoc at Humish. And we also have other collaborators now in India, uh, with NVIDIA Bangalore in developing some computational methods, some Professor GP Das, and at Bombay and IIC Bangalore, and also at Indo Korean Science and Technology Center. We also would like to acknowledge. Uh, the current funding agencies, IAC Seed Grant, ACRB Startup Research Grant, and NSM R&D for Exascale. So these are some of the publications we are interested in, and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Fani. So any quick question? If you have a question, please raise your hand so that I can unmute you. Or feel free to write it in chat box. We have time for one quick question before we move on. Funny, you can't hear me? I can hear you. Okay, great. Yeah, can you please? Okay, so that's all. There's no question at the process. No, that's not the question. That's from. Oh, mm -hmm. okay. That's for the workshop. Uh, okay, if there's no question from the audience, but I will, I want to ask a simple question. So, is this along the lines of the quasi continuum approach where you actually bridge the length scales? No, so quasi continuum or... approach. No, no, quasi continuum approach is a core spinning approach where you actually solve quantum mechanically in the region of interest, and away from it, you have some core spinning approximations where you actually lump a lot of atoms into one atom and then try to bridge the scales. So this is trying to do completely with the quantum mechanical accuracy. There is no approximation in the theories you're using. 
So there's okay, you take it as a discrete system as to then there's no homogenization yes, yes. there anywhere. Okay, no homogenization. So see the one quasi quantum approach in fought those days because there was no supercomputing power to actually solve big atoms. But today you can actually easily solve 10,000 atoms very easily. And if you are even interested in solving 10,000 atoms, we could actually solve that in a bit of quantum mechanical accuracy. So we do not want to have any uh, control approximations which exist in quantum approaches. Here, you don't have any approximation. You're just solving the PDE and it's full of its exciting leverage of the high performance computing architectures which are available today. Okay, thank you, thank you. And uh, are we more, mostly doing statics with it or can we move the defects inside the unit cell? Or is that yeah, so if you can move the yeah, you can move the defects because then we have to do a quantum mechanical model and simulation. So basically, you just evolve those defects using molecular dynamics. But the forces which are computed in this evolution of these molecular dynamics equations are not coming from empirical atomic potentials, but it is coming from density functional theory calculations, where you actually do a quantum mechanical calculation and then you try to compute those forces. In fact, this is actually trying to do in this work where we are trying to do uh we're just trying to move atoms in this particular process where lithiums are diffusing across elect from one electrode to elect another electrode via the electrolyte and the thing which governs this diffusion is this new transverse of motion which is the empty equations but yeah. what governs the interaction between the atoms during this motion is the quantum mechanical Interaction. So it's treated classically, but the interaction is treated quantum mechanically. So we actually compute forces using quantum mechanics, which is a more accurate molecular dynamic simulation than an empirical based calculations like you use in lamps or something like that. But of course, it's expensive. So we are developing methods to accelerate every time step. Uh, there's one question in the chat box. Uh, Bino writes Can this method be used in studying fracture at lattice scale? In principle, yes, you basically can use these equations to actually solve uh, interfacial energies and then try to uh, uh, try to actually come up with traction separation laws and then treat into microscopic scales. In that sense, you can use. Okay. Uh, uh, let's all thank uh, Professor Funny for his wonderful talk. Uh, thank you, Funny. So thank I you. will now pass on to the next speaker. Thank you very much.